1974, Doctor Who had been running on television for 11 years. That year would mark a period of change, with the show's lead actor John Pertwee, producer Barry Letts and script editor Terence Dix due to leave at the end of the 11th series. Tom Baker would be cast to take over as the Doctor, with the show's 12th series due to start in the new year. It was also in 1974 that young theatre producers Anthony Pygeri and Robert De Winter approached BBC Enterprises with their plans to adapt the series for the stage. While the Daleks themselves had appeared in their own West End show in 1965's Curse of the Daleks, this would be the first time the Doctor would be brought to the theatre. Departing script editor Terence Dix agreed to write the play. Pygeri and De Winter must have come to our office and got passed on to me. It seemed like an interesting idea. I'd never done a stage play before. I mean, the one thing that struck me when I sat down to write it is that in a stage play, you can't cut. It's all in long shot. You know, the, the audience is sitting back, looking at it from a distance. And in, you know, in the script, you know, cut, cutting is very important, you know, to emphasize something you want to do. But I, I remember that was a bit, a bit tricky to deal with. As negotiations were finalised to allow the play to go ahead for the Christmas of 1974, it became clear that both the show's departing Doctor, John Pertwee, and future Doctor Tom Baker would be unavailable to star in the show. It turned out that we weren't going to be able to have Pertwee, and uh, there was also uh, difficulties in negotiations over the Dalek, because uh, Roger Hancock, who was Terry Nation's agent, was a very tough agent, you know, and always pushed for the maximum. And for a long time, it looked as if we might not get either, as it were, you know. And I remember saying to the producers, look, we've got to have one or the other, you know. If we, if we have the Daleks, we can manage without the original Doctor, but we must have one. And eventually, you know, it came to it. The finalised script, entitled Doctor Who and the Daleks in Seven Keys to Doomsday, was set to open at the Adelphi Theatre in London's West End on the 16th of December 1974. Producers Pai Jiri and De Winter cast Shakespearean actor Trevor Martin in the lead role as the Doctor. Trevor was no stranger to the series, having appeared as a Time Lord in Patrick Troughton's final episode, The War Games, in 1969. I didn't like to be typecast if I could avoid it. And this was very different from Shakespeare, and I thought that was a good idea. And I thought I enjoyed, loved the idea of playing Doctor Who. It was easy, actually, for me, um, uh, mostly because of Trevor and, 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 the, and, and the, the fact that he, that he had a leading quality, you know, had a quality to lead, which was wise and useful. And he, he didn't throw his weight about it. It wasn't, he didn't, he, you know. It was planned that we'd do the season at the Adelphi for that Christmas, as it were, and then they lined up a, a big long tour at the end of January or the beginning, halfway through February or somewhere, was the end of the season, that, the, that season at the Adelphi, and then we would go on this tour and we were going to all the places, you know, Newcastle, Glasgow, Edinburgh, everywhere. Uh, and then that would end up, ended up at Blackpool. And we would do a summer season of it at Blackpool. And while we were doing the summer season at Blackpool, which would be several weeks, we would rehearse another play to go back into the Adelphi or somewhere similar for the next Christmas. And this, <laughs> if it worked, this could be a sort of an ongoing situation. And from my bank balance point of view, that was a very good idea. Doctor Who star had been on the ascendancy since probably the middle of the Pertwee period in terms of reaching out, bringing in more audiences, increasing the profile of the show, bringing in more media attention. And because it came in just before probably the most successful uh, time in Doctor Who's history in the 20th century, the Tom Baker period, um, it was that wonderful uh, stepping stone between Pertwee leaving the series with all of his hallmarks and Tom Baker really establishing his era. My father, who had no interest in Doctor Who whatsoever, saw an ad in the newspaper and drew my attention to it. And it said, Doctor Who and the Daleks live on stage. I was so excited. I remember poring over that ad and trying to imagine what this might involve. It's very difficult it was a diff to, to sort of explain it. 
nowadays, you know, we're used to things like Doctor Who and other programs being very accessible. You could you can watch episodes when you like. You can get photographs of it off the internet. Back in those days, it was really difficult to find photographs of Doctor Who. It was certainly it was impossible to watch an old episode. So the idea that you could go and see it live on stage was thrilling. See, the thing about this is I'm, I'm not really a director. I, 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 they chose me to direct that because it was very technical. And I, and I, and I was a line designer, which is very technical. That, that, you know what I mean? I, I, I'm not a, uh, you know, um, it's very unusual. I thought that it was very inventive and I thought, I thought the technical side was brilliant. Uh, and I, I suppose because because Mick was so good at lighting, and that was his, you know, he 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 was mostly interested in lighting. He was probably very interested also in all these technical things, and that's just it. They you couldn't have somebody who was being airy fairy. You had to have somebody like him, who was a a practical man, to to get this sorted out, and he did. He was very good. John Napier, who was one of uh, this country's best known uh, designers, uh, was taken on board in order to do the back projections and design the, the set. It was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. I think the most uh, important thing about the design of the show was that all the settings were done very cleverly with back projection. There were two angled screens and one center screen um, right at the back. And uh, the center screen could be raised and lowered to create another doorway through which characters could enter and exit. I can't remember all that went on, but I do know that there were things that were flown in, that is come down from the, from, from the roof of the theater, flown in and uh, the, uh, the set moved on stage and we had to be very careful where we were on stage in case it ran over us. Um, uh, it was a very technical production with actors. And so we did the dress rehearsal on the Sunday and thank God it worked on Monday. It worked on Monday and press was in and, and it worked. Looking back on it now, it's easy to see that the, uh, the show had to take a stance on who the new Doctor was um, because it was going to be played by Trevor Martin and not a current TV Doctor. So uh, they got round this by having a, a regeneration sequence. They had to change from Pertwee, who was currently the Doctor, into me. I had a Pertwee wig and uh, everything else and I had to get rid of it all in a, a sort of in a collapse state on the stage. It all went quiet for a moment and you think what now what's happening and suddenly there are voices coming out. Now I was up in up in the, the circle up in the gods and you could hear voices um, someone should help him and it, it, it sort of troubles the audience to start with because they think it's one of them and these two youngsters climbed up on stage. And just for that moment, especially being quite young and you know, relative, like, relatively naive, I think I certainly thought, what are they doing? That wasn't my idea, that was the director's idea. And I didn't like it, I thought it was too gimmicky, but on the other hand, the public seemed to buy it, you know, so it didn't matter. Like it was two audience members had suddenly got up on stage to kind of help this old guy who'd fallen on the floor. And, um, you very quickly realised that this was part of the show. It was a really nice novel way to start the show. And they helped the Doctor up and take him back into his police box. It came up on quite a reasonably faithful reproduction of the TARDIS interior, which is where the whole of the first scene was set, as you got used to the idea that the, something had happened to the Doctor, uh, something was happening to his face, uh, a sequence that was achieved by quite an imaginative use of uh, back projected slides onto screens that were set above the stage of the Radio Times 10th anniversary special image of three different doctors changing one into the other. They got shots of poetry and we had two 24 slide carousels 
shooting it alternately at a screen, a very big screen. And he had to sort of co had to, they had to work together. And gradually, it was, you know, it was him and me and him and me and, and so on until it was mainly him, 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 me, me, him, 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 me. Then it became me, him, me, 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 him, and gradually turned into me. And it turned out to be me at the end. And that's how they did the transformation. The fact that Tom Baker had just appeared on television two days earlier uh, was completely avoided by the stage show. They just went and assumed that the audience would take it that, you know, John Pert, we had been the doctor for the last four or five years, and now he is the new doctor. His mind wound must have triggered off the regeneration process. Trouble is, I always come out of it looking different. Feeling different too, mind you. I feel at least a hundred years younger. <laughs> well, now, do you understand? No. No. Yeah, of course you wouldn't. How could you? Well, that's my turn. Who are you two, and what are your names? Jenny. Jenny Wilson. Jimmy Forbes. And what I want to know is... How do you do? Very pleased to meet you. I am the Doctor. Doctor? Doctor who? Well, if you like. Now then, what are you two doing in my TARDIS? You're what? Time and relative dimensions in space. It's, it's sort of spaceship, a space-time ship to be exact. The newly regenerated Doctor and his companions, Jenny and Jimmy, arrive on the desolate planet of Khan, where they embark on a mission to locate seven crystal keys that make up the crystal of all power. With an evil force also seeking to find the keys, the Doctor and his companions must brave deadly traps and face terrifying monsters, including a logic battle with a computer and a race of servant hybrid creatures known as Chlorantulas. Originally called Crocs in the script, the Chlorantulas were named in a Name a Doctor Who Monster competition run by the Sun newspaper. John Napier, very famous designer, very much wanted to create his own monster. You know, he said, uh, there's no use employing someone like me unless you give me something to do, you know, it can't just be the Daleks. So that was very much his project, you know, to come up with an original looking monster, which I suppose he hoped, might have hoped uh, would take off like the Daleks, so they never, never did. My recollection of getting into the costume was that we had to get to the theatre very early in order to start the process of turning ourselves into blue people, which required us to take off all our clothes and uh, be painted blue and then put on this blue uh, leotard and uh, leggings um, but our feet had to be painted blue, uh, hands and face had to be painted blue and then uh, we had these white, long white wigs. Consequently we all looked fairly alien but human as well which I think was reassuring to the audience. Give me the seventh crystal, and I swear to you, the crystal of all power will never be used again. You desire the seventh crystal, do you, Doctor? Then take it, if you can. <laughs> you see, Doctor, the crystal is here, but you cannot take it. You are frozen by the power of my will. Only one whose will is stronger than mine can take the crystal from me. One that did stay with me and was a huge surprise later on was this towering tall figure called the Grand Master of Khan, who, to my delight, years later I discovered had been played by Simon Jones. Now, later on in my professional life and as a fan, I enjoyed Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Simon Jones was Arthur Dent. The part was written for him. Um, he's a very foursquare, English gentleman, um, and the idea that it was him under all that prosthetic makeup, standing what looked like on top of a stepladder, because he was so tall. I had to get up on the ladder and somebody had to push me on, so there was always a stagehand underneath, because the thing was on wheels, and I had to move about. But that, of course, made me glide. Obviously, <laughs> the Grand Master had no legs, but he obviously could glide. A terrifying character, actually. Uh, you, you know, um from the audience's point of view, and actually from mine, because I was always afraid he, he, he might fall off. I don't know that elf and safety would have let us do it if they'd been around at the time. My head was huge, like a large balloon. 
and it was filled with white fairy lights that flicked on and off. I can't remember how it was powered, probably the battery, I should think. And, uh, but it had to be something that was well controlled because as I battled my superior mind force against that of the doctors, slowly the fairy lights went out one after another. And by the time he won, so to speak, all my fairy lights had gone out and I slumped onto the library steps that I was sitting on. No, no, you cannot prevail. My will is stronger, stronger, stronger. Ah! In the second half, I trundled around in a Dalek, which couldn't have been more fun. My memories of the Daleks appearing is, is, is they did exactly what they did on television, which is always make you wait for them. So most of the first act before the interval um, was concerned with the other characters in the production. It's like, yeah, come on, come on, we want the Daleks. That's what you're waiting for. And I, as I remember it, you heard the Daleks' voice, first of all, very, very loud, echoing around the auditorium. Well, who are they then? I'm beginning to think I know. So the excitement ramped up and you could feel it that everyone was on tenterhooks waiting and they, they roll out from the wings. In there, all of you. But Doctor, that creature... We'll just have to hope it was frightened right away. And believe me, that overgrown lobster is nothing compared to what's coming along that tunnel. We know from our agent that the escaped slaves are hiding in these tunnels. It was also reported that our enemy, the Doctor, is helping them. You must find the Doctor and the slaves and exterminate them. Otherwise, you will be punished. Continue the search. What were those things? Daleks. The most evil, most ruthless life form in the entire cosmos. They're old enemies of mine, and they know I'm here. My children were very small then, and, uh, and the baby was left at home, with, the youngest was at home with a babysitter. And I got my eldest and my middle ones, uh, you know, to the show. And um, when the Daleks came on, the middle one, Jonathan, more or less panicked. You know, he, he didn't mind them on the television, but being in the same room where they might come up and get him was too much. So I had to take him home in a taxi, deposit him with the babysitter, keep the taxi and go back to the uh, Delphi, by which time the show was more or less over, you know, so I missed quite a chunk of the first, first night. My family at that time was my wife and two small children who had been following Doctor Who on television and were absolutely delighted that I was in it. So they came with my wife and I, she remembers that the fact they got out of their seats on more than one occasion and hid behind the seats that, uh, uh, that, that she was in because it was too frightening. Um, but children love to be frightened, you know, so that was, that was par for the course. As the Emperor Dalek, I had a silver top. Everyone else had a black top. And we manipulated the controls from inside. But I was the only Dalek who actually couldn't sit down because I couldn't see through the grill. So I had to stand and push the Dalek along, whereas everyone else could sit down because they were tall, strapping blokes. And, but I, I used to make faces at them and poke my tongue out through the grill to try and make them laugh, and they did see me. And it was just a fun thing to do, really. And Peter Jolly, he did the Dalek voice well the sound of the daleks and their voices off stage with a distorted microphone the thing that that, that, that you know being a lighting lighting designer i was out in the st stalls all the time so i could see what was going on all the time uh and there was something about those those, those things skating around the stage for possibly on a slight slope that it's very it's very hard not to be, not not for there to be something in your head of thinking he's going to come off the front. He's, you know. There was a scene in the show where, for some reason, Wendy had to be lifted into my Dalek, so we were both in there together. And Jimmy Matthews, who played the young boy assistant, he enthusiastically spun the Dalek round very fast, and it should have stopped, but he didn't. It, he was so enthusiastic, it fell. It fell sideways, and we fell into the orchestra pit, which was really scary. It was a good thing it was a rehearsal. It was very, very scary, and we were hurt slightly. And we, we felt 
very strange because the, Gar the Daleks were actually manned by trays of acid. And, um, but we were all right. It was just a shock more than anything. We were thankful it didn't actually happen during the show because that would have created a lot of havoc, as you can imagine. Everybody wanted to get in it and have a try. Do you know what I mean? The ones who didn't want to do that were the people who had to do it because it was extremely hard, you know. I, might, I, might, I, it's, it's, it, I think it's, uh, they, they should be very pleased with themselves that, the, that no, no, more stage, no, no more came off the front of the stage. Mishaps aside, Seven Keys to Doomsday was declared a success by the media. It did very well in the beginning. You know, we got a Bayes review in the Times and other good reviews and good houses. You know, it was a great success. They said. But um, unfortunately, at about just about that time, the IRA stepped up its bombing campaign. You could hear the explosion at night when the play was on and you think, oh, there's a bomb gone off, I don't know where that's gone off. There was a, a night that we were performing, uh, the audience was loving every minute of it, there were uh, lots of things going on on stage, um, we were enjoying ourselves on stage and giving the best performance we could, and there was a sudden explosion outside the theatre. Uh, the audience were aware of it, we were aware of it, and the show had to stop, and we paused. And the reason for the explosion outside was because, uh, unfortunately, during that period of time, in 1974-75, the IRA decided that they should uh, let London know that they uh, were very angry and existed and were planting bombs in London. And the whole of London was affected by not just that one explosion, but other threats that were going on at the time. And the show suffered because of that. I think you mentioned one went off at Selfridges, you know, which is not all that far away when the, in the early days of the month. And parents just did not want to take their children to the West End. I just thought, well, this is a big Doctor Who thing. Obviously, because I'm the biggest Doctor Who fan in the world, I thought, um, I'll have to go and see it. My parents said no. And uh, it's so definitely no, it was heartbreaking. And I, I couldn't... It was quite traumatising that, you know, this big Doctor Who thing was happening and I, and it had the Daleks in it, my favourite things, and I wasn't allowed to go and see it, so I was mortified, really. I don't think I've ever got over it. Lots of fans uh, were told by their parents, oh, I'm sorry, we're not going, and the audiences tailed off, so eventually, they, sadly, they had to close the show. Which I think is a great pity, because it was a very good show. To make matters worse, prospects for the planned tour were thrown into doubt. The producers, who were young and inexperienced, had simply spent too much money on the show. And I believe they spent so much money on the show that they had no hope of making a profit anyway. And the sets they made were too big to fit on lorries, so they couldn't go on tour. They worked it out that the cost of moving that scenery in those trucks, we would never be able to cover the costs even if we filled every theatre that we went to. And this, they tried so hard, and it was, this went on for about a fortnight trying to work this out. And we were told, you'll get the final decision on Saturday morning. If, it's, if we get the decision before midday on Saturday, that you'll cancel, that's it, it's cancelled. If they don't get it until after midday, you get paid for the whole tour. And at quarter to 12, the telephone rang and the, 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 the tour was off. And that's the end of that. Despite favourable coverage by the press, Seven Keys to Doomsday was declared a box office failure, having managed to only recoup £27,500 of the alleged £35,000 budget spent. The producers, in fact, lost their shirt. I know they, uh, metaphorically. Anthony Gideria had to sell his house, I do remember that. I mean, this was a disaster for them, and they really should have done well. And we felt nothing but sorrow for them, because we, we liked them a lot, which is an unusual thing to say of one's producers. The two producers very kindly gave us each uh, a, a, a plaque of about that size with the name and all the cast list and things like that. 
as a sort of memento. I gather that there are very few of these still around. I've kept mine because I do tend to keep things like that. It's interesting now to, uh, to talk about them and be reminded about them, you know, because they, they were big events at the time. I mean, having a show open in the West End at the Adelphi Theatre, you know, that was a great thing. People who've never had a chance to see the stage play um, probably never have a reason to hold it in any kind of high regard, simply because they never got a chance to see it and there are, there are no visual records of it apart from a few photographs. I think that's a shame personally because it felt like an episode of Doctor Who. It was sterlingly written by someone who knows Doctor Who backwards, Terence Dix. And in both feel, presentation and style, it wasn't like a pantomime, it was like a staged version of a Doctor Who story. Mm -hmm.